Welcome to the Southridge Election Forum 2022. It is run by the Town Election Debate Committee, which is myself um, and Rich Merrill. I'm Maureen Doyle, my, and I've been in town since 1978, but my great-grandfather uh, moved into Southbridge in the late 1800s, and my family has been here ever since. Um, I'm involved in the Conservation Commission, the Agriculture Commission, the Bicentennial Committee, um, the Landfill Oversight in the past, um, and, and thanks to all the school committee and town council candidates um, who are here, um, all the viewers and the voters on Tuesday, June 14th from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. Um, We've really got a lot of issues to talk about, and and here is my uh, is the moderator, Rich Merrill. Thanks, Maureen. Uh, since 1800s, her family's been around. I've been around here uh, not quite that long since uh, well around 1982 is when I first moved to town. I've never been involved politically in town except from afar. I've watched these candidates do this. I've watched the city council do that. All for no pay. You know this is a no pay job, right? This, this doesn't pay a cent. And it's amazing that we get people to run. Here today we have five candidates who are running for three seats on the town council. And we're not going to really call it a debate, but it could become a debate. It's more of a forum just to inform you as to what's going on in Southbridge and what these candidates think should go on in Southbridge. So we'll start the questions in just a second. We have a few rules, but first I wanted to introduce the candidates. And we're going to go from left to right and introduce the candidates that we have right now. On the far left is Mike Marchetti, who is a current incumbent on the City Council. And to his left, George Chenier. And then to his left, Mike Montigny. And then Nick Dedalt otherwise known as Nick Daydalt. I'll make that mistake all night long. And Jasmine Rebus is to his left. Now with any kind of forum, we do have uh, some rules, and this debate's no exception. The first, uh, each candidate is going to introduce themselves to you with their opening statements, and they will have a time limit of two minutes. They'll do their introductions and have a time limit of two minutes. Then we'll start the questions. The, we'll pick out a name out of the hat right here, or out of the basket that I have, and that candidate will answer the first question with a time limit of two minutes. Then we'll go to the left of that particular candidate, and they, each person will have a chance to, inter, uh, to answer the question with a time limit of one minute. We'll keep the debate moving with that time. The forum is structured round-robin type so that every candidate will have a chance to speak on every single topic, and for the First question, the response time, again, is going to be two minutes for the first person that's asked the question and then one minute response time. And we'll do that throughout the entire forum tonight. And it should last about an hour and 45 minutes. So how do we keep time of all of this? Well, we have the most sophisticated timekeeping system that you can imagine right here in Southbridge. And we'll take a look at that. Maureen Dow, uh, Doyle, who you just uh, met, is going to be doing the timekeeping. You've got three lights there, the red, green, and uh, the yellow. If the green light's on, you're on the time clock and you have your appropriate time to answer the question. When the yellow light goes on, that's telling you you got 15 seconds left. And when the red light goes on, you got to stop talking. That's my time. That red light goes on, the moderator can talk. You can't. I won't be rude about it, but I'm going to interrupt you if you start rambling on. I don't think that's going to happen today. Never has happened in the past. It won't happen today. And the other, one other rule is that they, if another candidate is referenced in uh, any of the answers, the moderator may grant a 30-second opportunity for a response, and the moderator can also follow up with the candidates when needed for clarification. And it's okay if you want to applaud during the opening and during the closing of the debate, but not uh, after every single question. We do have a few people in the crowd here today, a lot more people at home on the Southbridge Cable Network, and of course we're out there on YouTube anyway. Uh, so the potential is billions of people could actually be watching that. And we'll start with the first question. I'm going to be picking out a name out of the hat. Uh, well, let's do the introductions first, and then we will do that. Mike 
Montigny will be the first one to give you his introduction. Mike? Hello. Uh, thank you. Um, especially thank you to everybody involved, uh, Mr. Merrill, Ms. Doyle. Um, it's great to see that we have you know, five candidates that really care about the town of Southbridge running. It's not like that every year, and it's good to see that this year. Um, just a little bit about myself. I've grown up here um, for most of my whole life. I, I attended school here. Um, my family on the Montigny side uh, ran Vets Cab. It's been gone for quite a while now, and uh, a few of us all did some time working at the school system. <coughs> I, it was uh, the cable access department head here uh, for four years and the station manager of Southbridge Community Television. We built a great team. Uh, we ended up saving a lot of money, and it's always great to do an event here because I get to see everybody it keeps growing and growing into such an amazing department here. Um, I also was the teacher at Southbridge Middle High School. I mentioned uh, from 2012 to 2016, I taught high school video production. Uh, kind of went hand in hand with the media that we were doing here and that the school had the after school program there too. It was a class advisor of uh, the class of 2016. And um, I did a year in 2019 teaching uh, science, a grade six science, uh, certified to teach science in Massachusetts. Um, but I own a video company uh, in Southbridge, 6M Studios. I uh, filmed the same things that I used to do here. I bought all my own equipment and started my own business and convert VCR tapes to DVD. That's a really popular thing. Had the opportunity to expand that business down uh, to Puerto Rico for a couple years. And uh, those experiences have just made me fluent in Spanish and really understand the culture and community uh, around in New England. Um, so I'm really excited to be here, and I'm honored to be able to ask you, for, please vote for me on June 14th at the Community Center, Mike Montigny. Thank you very much. And you might notice Mike's got a couple of signs around town. I've seen some of the other candidates' signs, too. It's that time of year. Election time is two weeks from tonight, and the polls are open, as uh, Maureen has said, 7 in the morning till 8 o'clock at night. Now we'll go to Nick Dedalt for the opening statements. Two minutes, Nick. Good evening and thank you to the Town Election Debate Committee for the invitation to participate in this important event. I want to take this opportunity to introduce myself uh, to you, Nick Daydalt, as a candidate for Southbridge Town Council. I started off my life here in Southbridge in 1982, the son of two lifelong Southbridge natives who still live here in Southbridge in the oldest house in town on South Street. My mother and father both enjoyed an upbringing by uh, working class natives during a very prosperous time for the town and some tough times for the town just uh, like we've seen in recent past. I've spent the past 20 years in public service, becoming a firefighter EMT in 2002. I currently work as the Assistant Director of Central Mass EMS, which is the regional organization that oversees and supports emergency medical services for 76 cities and towns in Worcester County. I also serve as, as a disaster responder with the federal government, deploying to disasters in places such as San Juan and Manatee, Puerto Rico, following hurricanes Irma and Maria. It's an incredible experience to go there and, and, and help so many people. Um, and I've deployed to numerous locations throughout the COVID-19 pandemic throughout the U.S. Uh, changes in my family life over the last few years brought me back here to Southbridge, and I've become dedicated and involved in our community. In my spare time, aside from raising kids, Tyler and Casey are here in the audience tonight. I have served our town's fire department as a call firefighter EMT since my return to town, and I've loved every minute of my community involvement and service. I believe that there's no better time to serve our town while we have problems that have yet to be solved such as a path out of school system receivership, I believe there are many good things on the horizon for our community. You can see positive changes all around when you look at our street improvement plan, which is well underway, housing improvements and development, grant funded projects and investments in our town's much needed services. As a town councilor, I would like to do my small part in helping to lead our community back to being one where families and businesses are busting down the doors to come here, while keeping in mind the economic struggle, struggles that I, like Many of you working class, uh, hardworking families and individuals face every day. So thank you for having me here and I hope that you can support me on June 14th. You timed that with a stopwatch, you can tell. Two minutes almost exactly, Nick. Thank you very much. Now Jasmine, opening statements, two minutes. Great. Thank you. Good evening, buenas noches. Thank you to the town debate committee, Maureen and Rich. 
um, for putting this opportunity together for us to be able to introduce ourselves and answer questions tonight, so thank you. Thank you to our, my fellow candidates um, for participating and for running. Um, it's not an easy thing to run for office, and uh, I know because I've always been behind the scenes, so this is the first time I'm a candidate. Um, I'm Jasmine Rivas, and I've lived in Southbridge since I was five when my parents moved here from Hartford, Connecticut, um, and we lived on Mercy Street in a three-decker. I learned hard work, the value of hard work from my dad, who was a truck driver, and later became a small business owner when we purchased our first home um, and a small convenience store on North Street. I learned the struggles of um, an adult trying to become bilingual from my mom who took classes to learn English from QCC at night um, when they held them at Colav. My first job was at Lavallee's Pharmacy on Mechanic Street where I delivered prescriptions to older folks in the high rise across the street. Helping people has always been a passion of mine and becoming a town counselor would just be an opportunity for me to help more people in our community. My experience at the news as a reporter in the courts, in the district attorney's office, working in the schools, on boards and committees, asking the tough questions, advocating for those who can't advocate for themselves, managing departments and budgets, and collaborating with so many different people, some who are in this room tonight, some who are out in our community, um, makes me uniquely qualified to be entrusted with this important work. I know the dedication it's gonna take to move our town forward. And that's why I ask humbly for your vote on June 14th. Thank you, Jasmine. Thank Good you very us. much. We'll uh, head over to Mike, uh, Mike Marchetti. I'm, I know I'm going to call him Mark about 10 times tonight. I've already done it twice. It's Mike Marchetti. Even with the sign in front of him, I'm going to make that mistake. But Mike, it's your time. All right, thank you. Two minutes. First, I'd like to thank everyone res responsible for putting on this forum. I sincerely appreciate in being invited to participate. I've lived in Southbridge for almost 40 years. I'm married to Maureen Jibo, who is a lifelong resident of Southbridge. I worked at the Southbridge Evening News for several years as a graphic designer, and some of you may also remember me as the local cartoonist. Today, my wife and I are both retired. In 2019, I was elected to a three-year seat on the town council, and I have served on every committee the council chairman has asked me to serve on, including chairman of the DPW subcommittee, I've been advocating for road improvements in Southbridge for years, and through our committee's efforts, the town manager put forth a town-wide road improvement program. I was also chairman of the Capital Planning Committee. We worked on revamping our capital improvement program. Some changes have already been implemented. The manager and the finance director have asked that the committee be made permanent. And I also was on the curbside collection advisory committee. Free curbside garbage collection is ending in 2024, and the committee was created to explore an affordable replacement, and I would like to continue looking at the options. I also consider myself a watchdog on the council. I'm trying to look out for the taxpayers of Southbridge and hold the line on runaway spending. So I do work hard, I do my homework, and I attend all council meetings, including all subcommittee meetings. I always respond to residents when they call me with a problem, an issue, or a concern. I've done everything I can to best serve the community, and I would appreciate your vote, your vote on June 14th. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. And uh, to finish off the list, George Chenier. Thank uh, you. Old familiar face here in town, and he's back again. Thank oh, you, George. Rich. Two minutes. Maureen, Cable Committee, for doing this tonight. Uh, as everyone knows, my name is George Shenya. I've been a lifelong resident of Southbridge, leaving for a short time uh, to move to Florida, uh, just recently returning in November uh, to be with my family. I've been married 42 years. I have two children, one that lives in Southbridge and one that lives in Dudley. I have a new grandchild that was just born a few months ago, and I got three other grandchildren, a total of five grandchildren, and uh, we have a new one coming on hopefully sometimes after the first of the year. I've been involved in the town uh, for most of my life. I was a 22-year veteran of the Southbridge Fire Department as a firefighter EMT. I served on the airport commission, serving as its chairman for many years. I was on the town's recreation committee. 
uh, and serving as its chairman. And is also a former town councilor for two years. And I'm presently on the insurance advisory committee for the town. I was also a member of the American Red Cross, this, serving as a disaster specialist while I was in Florida and attaining the rank of uh, supervisor. I responded to disasters in Moore, Oklahoma, where 20 school children were killed by the tornadoes and millions and millions of dollars of devastation. I went to uh, uh, hurricanes within Florida and I also covered uh, New York City during Hurricane Sandy. Uh, I moved back to Southridge here in uh, November and some of the first things that were brought to, to me and complaints, I guess, if you want to call it, was the ever-increasing tax rate, the continuing deterioration of our roads, and the fact that we no longer uh, have control of our schools and people want to take that control back. So those are some of my issues that I have, and I'm, I would like to run for council and hopefully be elected and... I ask for your support in June okay, 14th. Okay, thank you, George. Thank you. So that's your five candidates. Again, three positions available, five candidates. You do the math. For all those people asking at home, I figured I'd better point this out because my wife told me I'd better. Uh, I have a granddaughter, I know George was mentioning his granddaughter, that I was teaching the other day how to ride a bicycle. Fortunately, my granddaughter is a better student than I am a teacher because this is the result of helping your granddaughter uh, ride her bike and showing her the wrong way to do it. I ended up actually having to go to Harrington Hospital on Wednesday with a concussion, seven stitches across my forehead, and a uh, broken nose as well. So here I am seven days later, or six days later actually, I'm walking, which is great, and the people at Harrington were fantastic. But I just wanted to point that out, that this isn't for decoration, it's, it's necessity. You don't want to see what's underneath. Now, we've got some questions, and I'm going to be pulling the first name. The first person to answer the question will be Nick Daydalt. And Nick, here we go. Question number one, trash pickup will become Southbridge's responsibility next year in 2023. There's a curbside recycling committee with a lot of suggestions include pay as you throw or perhaps a flat tax. Do we want to have multiple carriers or do we want to just have single carrier pickup or do we end up having every family for themselves and paying through a private contractor? Lots of questions in this question, but here is your main question. How would you select a trash option that would best benefit the residents of Southbridge? And you have two minutes to answer that question. Thanks, Rich. You know, I, I first I want to thank the current council and the folks that have worked hard on looking at this issue. Uh, it's an ongoing issue. It's something that folks have already spent a lot of time on. And I think for myself, I'm going to do my homework like Councilor Marchetti suggested. Uh, I've already looked over the options and, and we're going to continue to see the uh, options develop in front of us when we look at the cost of, of having a contracted hauler going with the uh, going with every family for themselves and, and utilizing a transfer station or picking their own hauler. We have to look at what's best for the families in Southbridge and that's how I'm going to make my decisions in general, not just on this issue. Uh, going before the taxpayers um, and asking for an override, um, it's never to me the best option uh, when looking um, to fund services in the town. It, to me, should be a last resort option. Folks are already paying enough in their taxes. We're already unable to pay our bills, by and large, because of the inflation and the problems that we're seeing economically in the country. So I'm not for saddling our taxpayers with another cost that uh, they should really be able to make a decision for themselves. So if it comes down to it, uh, and we need to put an override before folks, we need to put a question on the ballot that asks people what they're comfortable with, and that's what we're gonna do. Um, I think in the end, uh, as always, the council will do the best thing uh, for most people in the town of Southbridge, but it's a really difficult decision ahead. Thanks, Nick. Jasmine, we're going to you next. Every, every candidate will have a chance to respond to this question, and the responses will last one minute long. Jasmine? Thank you, Rich. Um, I've been watching the council meetings on this particular issue, and um, I know that they've done an incredible amount of work doing a lot of research, and certainly, like the other can candidates, I'll be researching it a little more as well um, on my own. But um, I think that 
the recommendations from the subcommittee um, that studied this, um, where the town would pick up, um, you know, the responsibility, I think, um, makes sense. Uh, we have to take care of our residents and make sure that, um, you know, the trash gets picked up. Um, I do like the ideas around, um, you know, kind of like paying for the trash bags and kind of like uh, paying, if you make a larger amount of trash, um, you pay for larger bags. Um, if you have less trash, um, you would pay for smaller bags. I think that um, when I was a resident in Worcester, this is how they, um, you know, they approached that issue. Um, I do think that it um, encourages people to create less trash and recycle. Um, so I am definitely in favor of making sure that people are encouraged to do that. I think combined with educating our public on these options and making sure the trash bags are available will help us. Thank you. Thank you. Mike Monchetti, how would you select a trash option that would best benefit the residents of Southbridge? Well, thank you. Um, I did serve on the curbside advisory committee and we did look at affordable ways to replace curbside garbage collection. I prefer keeping the same curbside collection we presently have. I've talked to residents who have told me they want to keep curbs the curbside collection as is. The issue is how to pay for it and who pays what. So I would like to continue looking at it, exploring it, and looking at different options. While I was on the advisory committee, I also discovered that the town can, see, can use CDBG funds to start a transfer station, and I reached out to James McCade of MassDEP, who said he would assist the town in starting a regional transfer station in Southbridge. So that's something that I would also like to work on as well. Thank you. Mike, thank you. George Chenier, same question, one minute. Uh, when this first uh, became uh, uh, a vote of the council a few months ago, I was opposed on the way it was being done. They were asking for an override question of $108 million, and they had no contract in hand and really no idea uh, on what they were going to do for a carrier. I myself like, like, would like to see it researched a little bit further, but I like a pay-as-you-go system, uh, as one of the candidates suggested, pay the bags, and uh, this way everybody pays for it. Uh, and the other thing that to offset some of the costs of that is, as Councilor Marchetti has mentioned, a transfer station, regionalized transfer station that uh, people would pay to go up there and, and dump, and it would help offset the cost of trash. But the way it was proposed, uh, like I say, a couple of months ago uh, for a, a override was $1.8 million with no contract, no, not even a a suggestion of what it would cost. And I was glad that it was sent to the town attorneys and the town attorney kind of ruled it out of order. So pay as you go with a transfer station I think would be a good idea. Thank you, George. And uh, last person to answer the question, Mike Montigny about the trash. Well, everybody's mostly said, you know, the right thing here. The, the council has done a great job providing information on the curbside advisory committee. Um, there's so many different options, and yes, the easy way would be able to somehow just keep things the way they are, but that does cost a lot of money. Um, so you've definitely got to look at next year trying to find the best way to free up some money to help the cause for picking the best thing for trash for the taxpayers' wallets. Um, the manager said that he was going to have a level service budget this year and it ended up having quite a few different positions in different departments. So I don't expect anybody to ask for anything next year and there's got to be some way that we can all work together, the council and the department heads, to find some way to free up enough money uh, to be able to provide the best solution for trash for our residents and taxpayers. And this is going to be an open question because I'm kind of curious now. When's it start? It says 2023. Is it June of 2023? Do you know? Any, anyone? When does what start? The trash pickup. When does Casella leave and then we are it up end, to... It ends in 2024, March of 2024. March of 2024. Right. So the question was incorrect there. It said 2023, so it's really 2024. Correct. I apologize. We, we really have to start in 2023, though. To, okay. So, yeah. All right, thank you. Uh, well, we get the question number two. 
And the first person would be Jasmine. Jasmine, this is the question that we have in front of us here. What do you think is the top issue that needs to be addressed as soon as possible? And how would you suggest we handle that number one issue? Jasmine, one, uh, excuse me, two minutes. Thank you, great question. Um, so, I mean, the elephant in the room, right? So our, our school system, and um, which is 50% of our town budget, uh, making sure that our town is ready when we come out of receivership. And I think that there are indications that we are headed in the right direction. Um, I think there are some good things the receiver's done. There are some things that we don't agree on. I worked in the school system, so I have an idea about budgets and about um, managing uh, positions in the school system and making sure that we are attracting um, you know, educators that want to be invested in our community. Uh, I think supporting our teachers, supporting our families is really important. Um, some of the some of the programs that the receiver has put in place are programs that are helping our students, um, especially through this pandemic. It's been really tough on our students and our teachers. Um, I think looking at that, but at the same time, getting our school committee ready to take back the reins, to make sure that our community is ready to manage our school system. It is a huge part of our budget and we should be in control of our school system and the receiver needs to work with us and I think at this point he is doing more of that. I think at the beginning there was some contention there but I think that we're coming out of the weeds and I think that it's important for us to support the school committee. They're getting training. We, we have a robust school committee now. I think there was a, some point where we had empty seats. Um, so all of those things indicate that we are on the right track. Thank you, Jasmine. And Jasmine brings up a point about the schools. Uh, we are actually going to have the school committee candidates after the town council tonight. So at about a quarter of nine, uh, you will see the school committee. For about 15 minutes, they're just going to kind of give an introduction. We have four candidates that are going to introduce themselves to you at home. Uh, Mike Marchetti, number one issue, top issue. How do you address it? Well, I think that economic development is very important in Southbridge, and so is the school issue as well. Um, I would like to see the economic development, which has been doing a pretty good job uh, finding grants for the community. I'd like to see them uh, do more on, on bringing businesses and job creating jobs in Southbridge. Uh, grants are good. They might help the local economy. But I would just like to see uh, more job creation and business activity, and I would like to see some. Uh, I would like to see some reports on what they're doing in that regard. A, a monthly report to the council: how many jobs they've created, how many businesses they brought here, how many businesses they've saved. So that that's what I think would be the top issue right now. If you want to lower the taxes, you need a broader tax base. So thank you. Mike, thank you very much. Uh, George Chenier, the top issue that needs to be addressed as soon as possible, how would you suggest that we handle that? I think there's two important issues that are affecting this town, the school and the tax rate. The tax rate in Southridge, uh, home ownership in Southridge is lower than rent is. 44% of the people that live in Southbridge live in rented apartments, and the remainder are homeowners. Rent is high now. In, in 19, 10 years ago, the rent, average rent was $8.95 in Southbridge. Presently, it's over $1,000 with a higher $2,000. The tax rate in Southbridge went down. They'll tell you, oh, the tax rate went down in Southbridge, but the bill didn't go down. I believe it's $17 and some change, and it was a high of $20 and some change. The problem that happened is the valuation of properties went up, and the, the bill was more. And it's going to be, again, more this year, because you're going to have a fire station be coming online that's going to raise taxes, and you've got a uh, trash issue that is going to be an issue. The other thing nobody's talking about now is storm management that is going to be required by the federal government. 
but we need to come up with a, a better tax plan and we need to come up with a school on how we're going to take our schools back from the state. Thank, Thank you, you, George. And uh, Mike Montigny. Thank you. Um, the top issue is certainly the schools. Uh, there are a lot of issues in town that we need to take a look at, but it all starts with the schools. If you don't have a good school system, no families are going to want to move here. If families don't want to move here, I mean, businesses aren't going to want to come either. So it has to get fixed, but you know, I've had the privilege in my lifetime, uh, especially with the tornado here in Southbridge, but in recent years experiencing a few different natural disasters. And what I remember from the tornado is that it really brought the town together. And the pandemic was certainly labeled a natural disaster. And I'll, I will say that the receiver has handled the COVID uh, very well. And it kind of brought everybody back down to earth on the same playing field. And there have been some good foundations built, uh, good lines of communication uh, with the receiver and the council that weren't always there in the past. So the receiver, the state, the commissioner of DESE, they all have to help us get the schools back into our control as quickly as possible, and everything else will fall in line after that. Thanks, Mike. And uh, finally, the same question to you, Nick. The top issue, how do you address it as soon as possible, and what would you suggest that uh, that issue is? Sure. Thank you, Rich. And, uh, you know, the other folks sitting up here hit the nail on the head in talking about the schools. It is our number one issue, and uh, I'd like to thank Mike Montigny for bringing up uh, the fact that if we don't fix the schools, we're not going to be able to fix the tax base issue, tax base issue that Mike Marchetti's uh, discussing. Uh, if businesses and families don't want to come into the town because of the glaring issues with our school system, uh, it, then we're simply going to be kicking the can down the, down the curb uh, with our tax base. Um, we, we can't do that for much longer. Um, we're heading in a great direction as far as our tax base goes now, and, and to keep that up, we really need to work together and take a team approach in supporting uh, our town manager and supporting the school committee, uh, making sure that that school committee is empowered to work with the receiver and coming up with a real definitive exit plan and path to improvement for the receiver. The goal of receivership is to improve the school system. It's not to be forever uh, indebted to the receiver uh, and having them run our schools. We need to take control back and, and improve that system so that we can improve the town as a whole. You know, I'm going to follow up with a question here. How long has it been since uh, Southbridge schools have been under receivership? Uh, four years? January of 2016. 2016. So it's January 2016. Six, yeah. So we're looking at six years. Yeah, I can't do the math. I'm expecting that you'll do it. Six years. Been that long. See, I was thinking four. Excellent answers, too, by the way. Nobody mentioned the Dairy Queen on Main Street, though. That's, that's, that was my number one choice, anyway. Hey, I've got a, a question number three, and this one will go to George Chenier. George, you've got a couple of minutes to answer this question. Industry and agriculture are important to our tax rate in town and help our community grow, employing local people. How would you promote local industry in the town of Southbridge? Two minutes, George. I think the important thing to do with uh, trying to promote industry in Southbridge is to have our community development office work hand in hand with uh, any individual or company that wants to come to Southbridge. I think the important or at least one of the issues, and, and, and it's important, that I've heard out there is when somebody wants to come to Southbridge to build, whether it's an industry, uh, a, a store, or even a homeowner, uh, they go before the different boards and have a difficult challenge. It's not an easy task for them to come to Southbridge and ultimately they get turned off and go somewhere else. Uh, they, they come into the departments, whether it's the building inspector, the planning board, the board of health, and they seem to run up with a, uh, a difficult customer service. They, uh, the, the, it takes a long time for this process to ha happen. I, I think if, if we can come up with a, and, and they've, councils have tried to do this in the past, but come up with a plan to make the prospect much easier I think that uh, we could uh, bring in more industry. And the other thing is, where do we put that industry? We, we don't have a lot of industrial space left. You have uh, the, the American Optical Company that's going and that's full. 
we have a few lots that's up on commercial drive, and then you get down to the globe, that is pretty much being used up with the uh, marijuana company and then with the A&M tool and die. So it's being able to find usable space also, and I don't think changing uh, industrial or uh, commercial uh, places in town back to a, a residential zoning uh, that is being done in some areas of town now with the planning board is, is the right choice. So I, I think making the process easier, working together to be able to make the process easier for industry to come to town would be a big step forward. Thank you. Mike, we'll, uh, we'll uh, give you that same question. Uh, uh, basically, it's how do you promote local industry in the town of Southbridge. Mike, one minute. Well, you know, George said it right there. Uh, there's the boards and the inspectors in this town uh, need to be a little more pro-business. Um, people need to have uh, feel like that these inspectors are working with them rather than, you know, giving them a hard time. We want businesses to come here. Um, but, you know, when, before I made the transition from the public to the private sector, I spoke at, at the dais about um, future plans for cable access to work with the Economic Development Committee. Uh, cable access it can afford to make a purchase for some drones, and I know that the town of Southbridge has some land and always comes in and out of different properties. I've always had a dream for cable access to work hand in hand to try to, uh, you know, help sell the, these properties and, and get businesses to come here because not only would it bring a business to Southbridge, but it would also make money for the town if they used town property that they were trying to sell. So there's lots of different ways to answer that question, but uh, we have a lot of resources in different departments that can start to work together to make it easier for everybody and businesses. Did you, did you catch that I have a dream speech, Mike, there? No. <laughs> I got that, and I thought you were really going to get up and start, uh, you know, hallelujah and all that. Congratulations. I can. That was a good answer, though. <laughs> One minute goes by so fast. Nick, uh, show us how fast it goes on that question. How are you going to promote industry into this town? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I think a lot of uh, towns that are successful in promoting businesses and industry are those communities that make their community the place that businesses want to operate. Uh, and the way that we do that is, like George mentioned, having a customer service oriented uh, town hall. I want to thank the work of the inspectors. I don't think it's our inspectors and our community and others that make the process of running, owning, and operating a business difficult. I think it's our boards and our committees, our, our, our staff uh, that need to be 100% uh, customer service oriented, whether they're dealing with a business or they're dealing with a citizen. If we make things a streamlined, easy process uh, for folks to want to work here and want to operate their businesses, then they're going to come in. And again, it goes back to uh, the school system. If we don't have families moving into town and we don't have an attractive, um, an attractive package, so to speak, to offer people to move here, then they're simply not going to want to come to town. So I think we need to fix the, the bigger problems in the room and I, and I really, in the community. And I, and I think that the rest of the good things in the future of the town are going to follow if we can. Okay. Nick, thank you very much. Yep. And one minute for you, Jasmine. Same question. Thank you. Um, like some, several of the other candidates, I think streamlining um, the process is one part of it um, and making sure that we are customer friendly and friendly to businesses, but the other part of it is not waiting for businesses to come to us. Being part and participating in different um, venues, whether it's connecting to the Worcester Chamber of Commerce, um, going out, um, I was recently at the Latino Business Organization um, where they've become part of the Worcester Chamber of Commerce, connecting our Southbridge Business Partnership who are doing a great job, um, you know, organizing the businesses that we have in our community, but it's a multiple approach, multiple ways of getting people to be attracted, um, but knowing about our community. Um, other communities don't know the assets that we have here and other businesses or industries out there need to know more about our community besides what they might read negatively in the paper. We have to be better at marketing ourselves um, and getting out there, getting the word out. Mike Marchetti, Thank you. promoting industry within the town. How do you do that? Well, all of the studies that I've seen on why businesses will pick a location in a community are two major reasons, proximity to the marketplace and a skilled workforce. 
Now, Southbridge's location puts us in proximity to two major markets, Greater Boston and Hartford, and that's a good selling point for potential businesses to come here, but the problem is we need greater access to the highways. Uh, 84, Route 20, Mass Pike. Uh, a former councillor mentioned at one time that maybe a Route 169 connector to the Mass Pike would help, and I thought that was a, a great idea. We also have to make sure we have a, a well-trained workforce for future jobs that required, that the businesses are gonna require, a lot of the uh, future jobs are gonna be in automated factories, robotics. There is a program for training at Quinsig. I know they are here in Southbridge, and I hope they can provide that training right here for our, our Southbridge students. Thank you. That brings us to the next question. Mike Montigny, you could be answering this question first. Uh, let me give you a little background first. History is so important and we learn from the past. Southbridge has a number of historic buildings that have been lost due to fire or have been torn down. Also, our cemeteries have been prone to vandalism. Do you have any ideas, and here's the question, do you have any ideas for protecting these architectural values and preserve the town's historical buildings and landmarks? Well, there's a bunch of different committees that all take part, some of the ones that uh, Ms. Doyle was talking about in uh, preserving all different types of things in the town. Uh, as far as cemeteries and landmarks, um, I know that Councillor Adams has done a great job with the memorials and trying to protect those. Um, there are, I'm sure that there are grants, there are people out there that work for the town that know a lot more than me about how to protect those things. And that's where, as a counselor, you have to make sure that you have the right communication with the town manager who has the communication with the department heads to be able to give us the information of all the different types of things that we can do on top of the things I've already mentioned to preserve these things. Um, it is sad about the cemeteries. I was actually, a friend of mine just went recently for Memorial Day and, and was sending me videos of how terrible some of them looked in certain places. And um, it's a great way to start a volunteer community effort. Um, it's. I think actually the restoration of gravestones is actually a pretty cool thing to see. Um, and it's, it's very rewarding because Southbridge does have a lot of history and you know, we, need to, we definitely need to protect that the best we can. Nick, the uh, question is about the uh, ideas that you might have protecting the architectural values and preserve the town's historical buildings, landmarks, and of course we mentioned the cemeteries as well. And you got one minute. Sure, I think Southbridge is a town that's very proud of its history and we need to continue that pride and, and show that pride in, in the maintenance of our historical landmarks. We've already seen historical landmarks in the community fall victim to deferred maintenance, which many studies have shown. Uh, if you look at the cost of a repair today and you defer that out over a number of years, your costs to repair, make that same repair, uh, are gonna go up exponentially. So we end up wasting taxpayer dollars by simply ignoring problems. Uh, you can see it across the street uh, with the fire station. The problems there were ignored for many, many years, um, allowing the building to come to its current state. So I think if we're gonna look at uh, preserving history, uh, we need to have a plan, uh, and we need to uh, Approach that like we have our street and, and road improvement plan. Take a look at the, at the targets uh, that are uh, most vulnerable in the town as far as our history goes and prioritize the preservation of those, of those uh, landmarks. We have a great planning and development department that's doing great work bringing grant funding into the town and I think they're a key asset when it comes to this effort. Thanks, Nick. Jasmine, the same question. It's about the historical buildings in town, the landmarks, and of course, we mentioned cemeteries, too. One minute. Thank you. Um, well, working at Oldster Bridge Village, I know a little bit about um, preserving historical buildings or learning a lot. Um, so I think Nick mentioned um, grant funding, and I think there is money out there um, that our community can seek in order to preserve some of our historic sites and landmarks are really important, um, and the history of our town is important to us. Um, you know, and certainly, you know, working with the commissions, um, working with the boards and listening to their recommendations as to what they suggest we would want to do. Um, and again, seeking the funding out there. On the other hand, also as far as 
the cemeteries and the vandalism um, in the cemeteries. I met with the police chief recently um, and talking about bringing back some of the crime watch meetings, making sure that people in the neighborhoods who care about um, you know, their neighborhoods and, and preserving, making sure crime doesn't happen and people don't vandalize, you know, our community is strong when we work together. I think um, tapping into neighborhood crime watches is a good idea and educating our community about how important our cemeteries are. I ran out of time. Thank no, you. No, that's, that's <laughs> fine. You know, I could never understand vandalism of uh, the town cemeteries or cemeteries anywhere. I just, I don't know, I can't wrap my head around it and I, I can't believe we even have to talk about this question, but uh, apparently we do. Uh, Mike. You do for about a minute. Thank you, Rich. Um, we do have a rich history in Southbridge, historical buildings. Uh, when I first came here, I was uh, just amazed at how old some of the buildings in, in Southbridge are, are. I'd like to see us promote a lot of the uh, historical landmarks and sites in town. Uh, if they're, I know that they're working on uh, a uh, grant to provide markers for all the historical sites in town. We also have an AO museum that's absolutely excellent, and uh, I would, I would like to see it if we could get that moved downtown somewhere so it's in a more prominent spot in Southbridge. I, uh, nothing against 12 Crane, but I, I think that it would, it would be a lot better if it was right in the center of town and people would see it right away. As far as the uh, vandalism at the cemeteries, that's. Uh, that's a sad thing to see, and I, and I have, would have to agree that some kind of neighborhood watch would be required for so, something like that, uh, so thank you. Thanks, Mike. I think everyone's going to agree as far as that vandalism is concerned. Shake my head. George Chenier, one minute. <clears throat> I, I think the, uh, the historical part of our community, our buildings, uh, we need to come up with a plan. What do we want to do? How much money do we want to put into it, and how we're going to do it? Uh, we can't afford to fix what we have now, uh, so a plan has to be done. I'll just use, for instance, Town Hall here. For years, I've been coming in here, and they've been putting money into a building uh, maintenance fund to do some work in here, and it's still not money. They transfer the money out of there to somewhere else. For instance, when you walk into the building, the carpets, when I first came back here in uh, November, December, they uh, said, let's get it done. The carpets still aren't done. So we have to come up with a plan, a funding mechanism, and determine how much that we want to spend as far as taxpayers' rate, but definitely apply for grants. Uh, the cemetery, with today's technology, is it time to put cameras in the cemetery? Maybe it is. Uh, we, can't, we can't depend on our police to be everywhere. Uh, in Southridge, there's 35,000 calls of service that the police had last year. They, they can't be everywhere, so maybe today's day and age and technology, it's time to put some cameras in the cemeteries to see what's going on and maybe be able to get some uh, arrest made. Thank you. Thank you, George. I'm going to pull in uh, my final name out of the hat here, and uh, it's uh, to Mike uh, Marchetti be answering this question first. Let me give you the background again. Roads in town need a lot of work, and everywhere you go, it seems that the roads need resurfing or some sort of other maintenance work. Uh, here's the question. What are your solutions to the conditions of the roads in the area? And uh, I do remember at your opening remarks you mentioned roads. Uh, it's a good time to mention it again. Two minutes, Mike. Well, thank you. I, I did serve on the DPW subcommittee, and we pushed to get the road, uh, road improvement plan implemented in Southbridge. Uh, I promised when I was running for town council three years ago that I would, that's something that I would work on. And I kept my promise, and, and we did work on implementing a road improvement plan. Um, the other, the uh, problem is I, I go downtown, and I look. I, I was downtown one day, and a woman was trying to, a young lady was trying to push her baby carriage, and she was having a hard time navigating the sidewalk because it was, it was all broken and cracked. And, and then another time I was on Elm Street, and I saw a woman fall down because of the sidewalk that was cracked and heaved in the center. So I've been pushing for roads and sidewalks to be fixed. Uh, we get a lot of grants for things like rail trails. Do you think I, we want to, I want to spend money on rail trails, or do you think I would like to see the money spent on road improvements? I think that I would like to see the road, roads, uh, roads and sidewalks fixed first. Um, so that's... That's how I see it, so thank you. 
Thank you, Mike. George, a follow-up for one minute about the roads in Southbridge. Coming to town back in November, it was one of the top issues that people talked to me about. Our roads are in deplorable condition. Our sidewalks are in deplorable condition. Last year, they put a $1.5 million into road repair. This year, they put in $1 million, and council took some extra money and increased that from capital leftover money. Uh, 220 permits for trenches were taken out of this town since 2019. And at the last DPW meeting, uh, no inspections were done to see that they were done completely the way they are. So oversight is needed. That is something we're lacking in this community when they do a project. Look at Main Street, for instance. Main Street is in terrible shape, and it was done last year. I realize they're trying to work with the uh, contractor to fix it, but the town admitted no oversight from the town, and I say, where was the engineers? So the biggest thing is, no matter what we do, let's have oversight. And let's, I, I believe we should look at the road management plan a little bit differently, too, because I've been told about Edward Street. It's serviced by Wells, two funeral homes, and a church. The time's out. So. Okay. Thank you, George. Mike Montkignate. One minute about the roads in Southbridge. Thanks. Yeah, um, you got to continue to execute the road study, which I, I've seen the study for this year, and it's, it's great what they plan to do. But, you know, it, like Councillor Marchetti said, it's not just the roads, it's the sidewalks too. And, and honestly, like, we're at a disadvantage to having to deal with a receivership and trash pickup because the roads should be our biggest issue and we have all these other messes to clean up first. But the roads are going to be consistently worked on. I do feel this way for the future because the DPW director just left and we're going to be hiring new positions as well there and we have to make sure that we hire people that are road oriented and know what they're doing with the roads. There needs to be more oversight when we have big projects like redoing all of Main Street. Um, and you know, sidewalks, babies falling, you're, you're not going to have families move here for that. You go to look at a home on Denison Hill and you can't even make it past the church without your car getting all messed up. So it's like, it's another reason with the receivership to keep families out of here. We've got to fix the roads. And uh, Nick, one minute about the roads in South. Like others have mentioned, I'm not one to reinvent the wheel. We have a road improvement plan that is working and uh, it was done so without going to the taxpayers with a ballot question for an override or another uh, funding mechanism that would come directly out of the taxpayers' pockets uh, by increasing the tax rate. Uh, so I think we need to stick with that road improvement plan. And like uh, Mike Montigny mentioned, we have the opportunity now to bring a, a, a DPW superintendent on board. And I'd like to bring somebody on board that has a proven track record of providing oversight uh, and management of important uh, projects like our road improvements, but also state projects that are going to occur down the road. We saw with the Main Street project that there were certainly some deficiencies uh, in most of our view, like the missing turning arrows that were left out of that project. I think some oversight from the town, even if it's a state project, uh, would be really important in those cases. And, and now's the time to take a look at that in our hiring process for the DPW superintendent. I've heard a lot of uh, words about oversight. Jasmine, do you agree about the roads in Southbridge needing a lot of oversight? You got a minute. Yeah, I think anytime you have a big project, it's important for um, having someone that can manage it and make sure that you're spending the money wisely and you're not, um, you're doing it in a thoughtful way so that residents can still continue to go to work um, and go about their business throughout the day. I think we are on the right track. Um, I think that the road improvement plan, like like several others said, you know, um, don't reinvent the wheel. We've, we have that. We are on the right track. Um, and, you know, some of the money came from um, our expanded revenue when we brought in the dispensary. Um, you know, thinking of ways to fund the roads where we're not putting the burden on our residents, um, that's something that we need to continue to look at um, and being creative about funding all of these big projects that does take a lot of money. Um, asking our state reps and our state senator um, to help us find that funding and to get our roads fixed because all the other things are connected. We can't attract um, 
you know, we can't attract business if we don't have good roads. Thank you. We're going to move on to the next question here. And uh, this one is going to George Chenier. I would call it a softball question, actually, because we've talked about some of the roads in Southbridge. We've talked about some of the things that Southbridge has done uh, that could be improved. I'm doing it wrong right now. But uh, George, you've got two minutes to answer this question. Here's the question. What is Southbridge's greatest strength? Southbridge's greatest strength. What are we doing right in town? It's people. Salvage has great diversity of people. They come together when they need to come together, and they work together as a community. And that's the first step that we have in Salvage as a great, great town. I've seen that in good times and in bad times. This community always bands together and helps out those that need to be helped. So for me, what I see is the greatest asset for this community is the people that live here and work here. Thank you. And we'll move on to you, Mike. Mike Montigny. One minute about yeah. the greatest strength of Southbridge in your mind. Southbridge's greatest strength is definitely its people and its community. You know, one thing that I always took pride in was being a teacher in this town. Um, I didn't want to teach for anybody else except people from Southbridge and the, uh, our youth. Uh, just like myself and others that have grown up here, I, I, they're some of the best people. They have to go through um, a suburban town with an urban population, and you learn so much and you experience so much. And actually, when, when I did work at Northbridge Public Schools, it was for Southbridge born and raised Amy McKinstry as the superintendent. So I, I really, the, the community here is what is going to make Southbridge come into this rein, reinventing that we're trying to do for South, which is never going to be as great as it was, the same way it was in the 70s that people always talk about, but in the future here, it's going to be our community and the people here. It's some of the best people I've ever met uh, and totally the people in the community. Thank you, Mike. And now over to Nick, Nick Dedalt. I think, uh, again, it's, it's our community. That's our strength. In particular, the folks that serve our community, whether it's through volunteer groups, faith groups, as well as our dedicated team of town employees uh, that work in many cases for no money or for very little money. Uh, the folks that stay here uh, because they love their town, those are, uh, are the backbone of the community. Uh, I can say that as somebody that's worked in, in government for many years, there are many other choices out there for, for relatively um, you know, uh, limited skill sets, uh, whether you're an educator or you're a police officer, you're a firefighter, or you work for public works, you can always go work somewhere else. But people choose to work here because they love this town. And people choose to live here because they love this town. And that's our strength. And Jasmine, Southbridge's greatest strength. Obviously, it's people, our community. Um, in times of trouble, um, Hurricane Maria, our community agencies, our social services came together to help so many families in our school system. Um, our faith community uh, always steps up, whether it is food insecurity, um, whether it's homelessness with our, um, you know, St. Luke's homeless shelter helping our the people in our community that need help. Um, our police department, um, there's a lot of communities that are always complaining about their police. Um, our Cops and Kids program has helped so many students, inspired so many kids to become police officers. Our community policing is a model for so many other communities. I think our youth is a source of strength. Um, they get a bad rap. I mean, Beautify Southbridge a couple of weeks ago, we had over 100 volunteers, and most of them were youth in our community. That is our strength and our asset and our future. And the last one to answer the question would be Mike Marchetti. I've heard people from just about everybody so far. I would imagine you'd make it unanimous. Yes, thank you. I, I would agree it's the people of Southbridge that really make is our greatest strength. We have a, a great diversity of uh, residents in Southbridge, and I agree they, they work together to try and beautify Southbridge, as Jasmine has said, and 
So I, I would agree the people are very important, but also I feel that our history is very important too. If you look back at the history of Southbridge, it's very fascinating to see all the different groups that have come here over the years and have made Southbridge their home. So people, number one, but also I feel the history of Southbridge is also one of our greatest strengths. So thank you. And thank you. You know, we're about halfway through. Actually, it's about 8 o'clock right now, so we're uh, more than halfway through. Another 45 minutes to go. We have a lot more questions to ask, and uh, this one will be go to Jasmine, Jasmine Rivas. And uh, it's a little bit wordy, but it's a kind of an important question, and it's almost like a question within a question as to how we react with the state here in uh, Southbridge. I'm going to read it. Uh, Maureen Doyle wrote this question. She's part of the Conservation Commission, and this is a very important subject for her. Climate and weather changes are always in the news, and the state of Massachusetts has created a Municipal Vulnerability Preparedness Program, MVP for short. Towns can apply for grants from the state to address flooding or other climate change issues. Here's your question. Do you know anything about this program? And would you think it's a good idea to apply for one of these grants to address weather-related issues in the town of Southbridge? Yes, I do know about it. I was actually part of the group. <laughs> um, and there was a lot of really important work that went on in that group. Um, a lot of different uh, sectors from our community participated. And I learned an incredible amount um, about bridges and, um, you know, conserving and, you know, being ready for any type of weather-related flooding. Um, I learned a lot about flooding <laughs> from our DPW um, and a lot of different people in our community. Uh, I think it's important. I think any time that we can go for funding uh, where we're not putting the burden on our taxpayers to prepare our community for any emergency event, I think it's absolutely something that we should do. Um, you know, if we ever had flooding in our community as we have in the past, um, you know, a lot of, there's a lot of vulnerable parts of our community and we wanna make sure that our residents are gonna be safe and that we have a plan. Um, I know that um, we do have an emergency preparedness plan, um, but getting the funding is really important to support all of those plans that we have in place and make sure that things like, um, you know, tree planting with, you know, the opaque um, um, tree planting project that we support that, um, you know, that brought in money to plant a thousand trees in our community so that it could offset the emissions and the heat zones um, in our community that contribute to the asthma rates um, that had been studied a few years ago. We want to do as much as we can because any weather related um, impact is a justice, a social justice issue, um, and it affects people in our communities that are vulnerable. Thank you, Jasmine. Mike Marchetti, it's really all about getting money from the state. If it's available, we should go get it. Absolutely, yes, I agree. It's always, uh, if you can get money from the state, I absolutely support that. I, w I wasn't involved in the, M you call it the MVP uh, commission, study, I wasn't involved in it. I think there might have been a conflict in uh, my uh, something uh, other group that I was in. But I absolutely agree that climate change is real and we have to do something about it. I'm not, I don't know if I agree too much with the Green New Deal. I think that's a little over ambitious, but I, I do agree if we can get funds from the state for this, absolutely go for it. Uh, I looked at the stormwater man. Uh, stormwater requirements that we have, and I thought that was a totally unfunded mandate. So as long as we can get uh, funds, I'm all for it. I know that, as Jasmine has said, we did vote on a comprehensive emergency management plan, which created a framework for the emergency system in Southbridge. So thank you. Thank you, Mike. And George Chenier. I'm not up to date on the MVP. I'll be first to admit it, but I do know that climate change affects us every day of, the, of our lives. Uh, as Mike said, I'm not too sure if the green, new Green Deal is the process the way to go, but I think if we can uh, start with conserving our natural resources, our waters, our forests, that it's a step in the right direction to be able to get some control of uh, climate. 
uh, I, I'm opposed to some things like, like electric vehicles. They talk about electric vehicles going to be the lifesaver of the uh, carbon, I guess it is, or the gas and oil, the pollutants that come from that. And that's the, the wave of the future. But they don't tell you what you're going to do with the cost of batteries, what you're going to do with the batteries when you're done. And that, as some studies show, that costs you more money. So, uh, yes, we need to apply for any of the grants that we're able to to help conserve our waterways and our uh, forest. And over to Mike Montigny. Yeah, so the flooding has, of course, taken a toll on Southridge over the years, the last 50, 70 years. Um, so anything that you can do to provide help for that, because still, when the rain gets tough, it'll still flood down in Everett Street and other places. But, you know, here, there's not too many natural disasters. Um, you know, we did have the tornado. I don't think, I wouldn't advise throwing grant money into a tornado, but I'm sure, you know, there could be other things that could help that situation. Cable access used to have a emergency alert system that was hooked up to the fire station. Maybe even grants uh, for this could help pay for that. But grants all around are a good thing. Um, it, whenever you can have the state work hand in hand to do something better for your community, um, you, you're going to get more people that want to live here and be a part of the already great community that we have now. Uh, thank you, Mike. And uh, Nick? I've seen firsthand uh, from a federal perspective the effects of a lack of preparedness when it comes to natural uh, climate-related disasters as well as health hazards. Been to, uh, like George, Hurricane Sandy, New York City, and saw the tremendous effects that uh, Hurricane Sandy had on that region. I was at Puerto Rico after Hurricanes Irma and Maria. Uh, all of these disasters are arguably from an environmentalist's perspective caused by climate change. So I think we need to aggressively pursue grant funding opportunities with uh, federal and state to improve our resiliency. Uh, and keeping in mind, like uh, Councillor Marchetti said, unfunded mandates, uh, you know, those unfunded mandates are that, that we've seen placed on cities and towns have historically gone funded at some point by outside sources. So I think we need to continue to prioritize our community without uh, heavily impacting our taxpayers and pursue outside funding sources for common sense resiliency measures. And thanks, Nick. I'm going to move on to the next question here. Earlier uh, tonight, a number of uh, people actually mentioned the top issue in Southbridge being the schools. The next question has something to do with the schools, and this would be for Mike Montigny. Uh, here's a question, Mike. Uh, what's the working relationship like between the town council and the school committee, and how does this Southbridge gain, regain full control of the schools from the state? What kind of timeline? What are we waiting for? It's been, you said, six years. Uh -huh. When does that happen? The town council and the school committee, I think the relationship gets better and better every year. Uh, Chairman Merch is, is always available to speak to there. And, uh, but the thing is, is that the school committee doesn't have any power. Um, it, it's all in the power of the state right now and the receivership, and that is exactly the problem. But the town council, if you're talking about relationships, you talk about the one with the receiver and the state. And like I said before earlier today, the pandemic kind of brought everybody together, and everybody has done a really good job on the town council of forming good relationships with the receiver and with the state. Um, you know, the governor is probably going to change this year in Massachusetts, and maybe that can be somewhere where we'll be able to start and look for some help in getting the state to leave quicker. Um, but with help, we all need to work together to get the, this good, because you can't just throw the state out. It's not what's best for our students. We have to have some sort of a dismount plan, a strategy, and it has to be done sooner than later. I, I do not want to see the state running the school system at the end of my term, at the end of these three years, the state needs to be gone, and we need to do everything we can to keep that line of communication open. We need to keep building those relationships and move forward with as many people as we can get on board. The commissioner, the governor, the receiver, and of course the town council, and the school committee will be right there the whole time. They've got to, they've got to get their power back to, to make the right decisions for our kids, the budget, the policy, um, and I, I fully see that happening too. I completely believe that the state will hand it back over sooner than later. 
And again, I think you said it uh, six years. I said I thought it was four, and mm. Time six flies. years. It yep. has gone. It's gone by fast, but it's gone by so slow too. Exactly. If you think it on both sides of that, we're looking at uh, Nick Dedult. What's the relationship between the school committee and the uh, town council, and uh, how do we get Southbridge to gain, regain full control of the school from the receivership? I'm not an expert on the education topic, but what I do know is that we solve problems through a team approach, and the, and the council, as well as the school committee, need to have a cooperative relationship in coming up with a plan to get off of receivership. I know I'll probably get fact-checked on this, but I don't think a single community that's gone into receivership since 2010 has come off. And it would be great to see our boards, committees, and our staff in this town work together to get us to be the first community to come off receivership because there's many studies that, are, that, are, that have been done that I've, I've read a little bit about that show that takeovers of any service by an outside entity are harmful in the long run. Uh, and, and we're on that long run path if we don't start acting now to demand a definitive plan to move forward. Jasmine, the same question to you. Yeah, so I do agree that um, the relationship between the town council, school committee, and the receiver has gotten much better over the last few years. I, I do think we're on the right track. There are definitely um, some very strategic things that we need to do together. Um, that, that is the key word, um, to get us to a place for us to take over our school um, system again. I think that the school committee now is more well-trained than they used to be um, under the leadership of Chairman Murch. Um, I do think that we need to coordinate with other communities, Nick is right, all communities across the state that are under receivership have remained under receivership. The state law is very vague. There isn't any um, you know, definition as to how to get out of it. Um, I think that our communities need to get together, put pressure on the state, uh, you know, ask our state senator and our state rep for help in changing that law and looking to the new governor for help in getting us out of receivership. And we look over to you, Mike. Mike. Thank you. Marchetti. Well, I, I don't know if the council and the school committee and the school receiver have any working relationship, but I would like to see more communication between us. Uh, the council should listen to the school committee, see what they have to say, and work together with the receiver. Right now, the school receiver does have all the power on educational issues in our public schools. Now, I remember when the state first took over and their report was that, a good summary was that the, the, uh, the town had no effective management of the school system and they said it started with the school committee. Now, whether that's true or not, I don't know, but that's what the state said. So the school receiver is here to turn things around and it will up to be, the, be up to the school committee to run things after he leaves, and eventually he will leave. So I would like to see some control of the school district given back to the school committee. Thank you. And George, you're the last one to talk about the relationship and how do we get out of receivership of the Southridge schools? Well, I, I, in general, I think we, we have a good council. They really care about this community. They may not agree with the, some of the things that they do, in the school committee, when there's an issue, they, they try to work together. I think there's more of an issue between the receiver and the school committee. Way too often I hear the, uh, the receiver won't go to a school committee meeting because he doesn't like what is being said by school committee members, so he sends his assistant. I asked that question at the budget hearing. $31 million budget that went through subcommittee in like 10 minutes. And I asked the question when he was all done making his presentation, is there light in the tunnel? And Dr. Valar's answer was no. He didn't see light in the tunnel because there's a lot of issues still moving within the school. One of the big issues was attendance. So what I would like to see if, if elected is the council, school committee get together, enforce the state to come up with a, an exit plan, a short exit plan on how we can take over. Lawrence, Holyoke, Southridge, and uh, I forget the other town, and soon to be maybe Boston. And there's no exit plans for any of them. Thank you. Does anybody know that other town? I'm, I'm, Holyoke. I, 
I think you might have gotten them all. Lawrence, Holyoke, Lawrence. Southbridge. Oh, yes. There was, Lawrence, one other one. I, I think nobody has that answer. Soon Boston. Chelsea. One of the Boston. South Boston, you said? I believe the Boston school system. Could be. I, I don't know. But uh, obviously it's an issue and a problem. And hopefully we can deal with it. Uh, this is for Nick. Nick Daydalt. Uh, every year there's a question about the water and the sewer rates in town because the rates keep going up. This is a question that comes up all the time. Here's your question. Is there anything the town council can do to stabilize the water and the sewer rates? Nick, two I'm minutes. I'm not familiar with uh, issues specifically surrounding our water and sewer rates, to be quite frank. But in general, in areas where uh, I lack a great deal of familiarity, I'm not going to see my role as a town councilor to uh, necessarily micromanage our departments uh, and to get down into the weeds with our departments. But I think, like any issue I'm not familiar with, I'm going to sit down with the department head uh, who will will have incoming in the DPW and, and overseeing the water and sewer in that position as well and have a frank discussion with them about what's driving up those rates. Uh, we need to look at any areas where uh, there's a consistent rate increase uh, without necessarily an explanation for what that rate increase is. We have to know what we're getting for our money. Uh, so that would be my plan to address any area of concern where, where rates are going up is to get an explanation for that and get an understanding of it. Jasmine, uh, same question. Is there anything that the town council can do, anything about the water and sewer rates? How does that work? Yeah, I, um, I'm very familiar. I help my parents pay for their, um, you know, water and sewer fees. So um, it definitely goes up every year. Um, I think that uh, it's important to look for ways to help residents and especially our residents who are on fixed incomes to be able to afford um, to pay for these bills. Uh, I think that looking for, you know, ways that the town might be able to subsidize, you know, or the state or federal funds or bringing in money or some kind of programming that's going to help our communities. Um, but I do agree with Nick and um, asking, you know, our, our boards or, you know, the committees to explain when a rate is going to increase, you know, why, what is, you know, what is the justification behind that increase? I think that it's gone up a lot every single year, and I think that it's becoming harder and harder for our families and our residents to pay for these bills. Mike Marchetti about the sewer and the uh, water rates. Uh, thank you. Um, well, escalating rates have been a problem for the, ever since the council turned over the water and sewer utilities to private management companies. Uh, part of the problem that I see is that the town has used this arrangement as for a hidden, to raise a hidden tax. So part of the payment for water and sewer comes back to the town in so-called enterprise funds. And I think the town should resume management, managing the water and sewer utilities and, and take responsibility themselves for uh, the rate increases. Thank you. George? I have to disagree with Councillor. Mark Eddy. Uh, I think the town council has done a good job at holding the rates relatively stable or low. What people don't understand is the regulations that are required for sewer and water treatment that cost a lot of money. There is continuing upgrades to be done to both the facilities and that money has to come through the rate payers. Where I would hope as the town moves forward and the, and the towns are surrounding us, if we can continue to sell water to those communities, it would help. But if, if you look at the regulations that are put forth by e, e, EPA, the DEP, the federal government, state's government, uh, you're going to see that the cost related to that is uh, what r drives the rates. And taking control of the sewer treatment plant with, with town employees over uh, the people that run it, I, I would be opposed to that just because of the, I believe the cost is going to be really extraordinary high. Mike Marchetti, uh, George had mentioned your name. I just wanted to see if you wanted to respond back to him. <coughs> T take a few seconds. Just no, to uh, I, don't, I don't have any problem with that. We respectfully disagree on an issue. Uh, that's fine with me. I just feel that... 
we don't really know what it's costing us at the sewer plant because all we do, or the water plant, we receive a bill and, and we pay it, and that's it. So if the town was to take it over, we could actually see this is why it's costing you and this is how much it's costing you. And some of the, some of the things that they spend money on, like chemicals for the, for the plant, we have no idea where that's coming from. Could the town save money by putting that out to bid? That's something that I would like, like to look at. So I don't have any problem with uh, disagreement, though. We, we uh, agree Mike, to disagree. Thank you. Mike uh, Montigny, the same question about the water and sewer rates as far as the uh, town council is concerned. Yeah, um, the sewer plant definitely has constant repairs, and that's something that's uh, going to be hard to get away from when it needs to be constantly repaired. But many moons ago, there was a strong town council that had the water company, uh, even in great deals with Charlton, where we're making a lot of money. And then other councils kind of gave that away. Um, but now what we can do, um, you could certainly have some more oversight. Taking it back to a public business is, is one way to do it. Uh, it was running well at one point, but you got to find a way to curb spending as much as possible, especially in a year where we're supposed to have a level service budget and we have many new positions. So next year, it should be very easy for everybody to try to keep rates down, pay for trash, not have to do that last resort two and a half override to pay for anything, and start to stabilize and, and fix the, the high rates. Thank you, Mike. Going to look at the next question, and this one's go to uh, Nick DeDalt. You just answered that last question. I'll get to you next time. Uh, Jasmine, Jasmine Rivas, uh, regarding public safety, how do you so how do you think Southbridge ranks overall? I'll tell you why I asked this question. I look back at a bunch of questions that Bob Cherneski had given me from previous uh, previous uh, debates, previous forums. This one goes back to the 1980s. I think it was even before we had the police station. I, I, I could be a little fuzzy as far as the dates are concerned. And at that time, this was a big question because we needed a new police station at that time. I think it's uh, a good question to ask now, considering the vote on the fire station and that we're going to be building a new fire station. Regarding public safety overall in Southbridge, how do you think we're doing? I mean, there's always room for improvement, right? Um, and so I think that our police and our fire department do a great job in providing services for our community. Um, you know, it, in different, uh, different times throughout the years, we've like seen the police department kind of shrink and it's sort of getting back to, you know, the robust um, department that it used to be. Um, again, the Cops and Kids program, our community our community police, they do a lot of work in our community. We see them out everywhere. They work really hard. Um, I think that, you know, I think that there are ways for us to continue to provide those services um, and also find ways to fund different positions and, you know, things like um, the, do, the new domestic violence um, advocate that is paid for through a New Hope grant um, that provides social services for domestic violence cases in our community. Partnering with other services and other organizations to provide um, support for the work that the police department does, um, you know, that is important to our community um, and for the fire department. I mean, you know, I think that our chief does a good job in presenting all of the information and trying to make a cost effective. Um, I think I watched the recent meeting where they talked about vehicles and vehicle, vehicle maintenance um, and, you know, vehicles that are extremely old and unreliable, um, but looking for ways to repair vehicles or fund vehicles in a way that isn't going to put such a burden on our residents. So I think that just being thoughtful in those ways and working together to make sure that the services are being provided, um, but not putting an undue burden on our residents. Now for this question, I'm going to mix up the order a little bit because we heard from Mike a couple of times. Mike Montigny, could you answer that question? Regarding public safety, uh, how do you think Southbridge ranks overall? 
Yeah, you got to look at public safety too as DPW being a part of that and the roads and the sidewalks, they need to be safe too. So we always got to keep that in the back of our mind as we go through these times where we rebuild that. But the police and fire are excellent in this town, uh, in my opinion. Uh, that's because of the community and the fact that they're so homegrown. I mean, we have an excellent chief in Chief Woodson who grew up here, and, and Deputy Chief Jose Dingy has created a great program of cops and kids back many years ago, and there's a lot of data that backs up that that program has helped the youth in our community. And I feel very safe here. I, I, uh, I've, I'm always, you know, listening to the reports that the police put out on Facebook and everything, and, and people th that are getting in trouble here, it's, it's really always isolated incidents. There's no random uh, crime going on. And I think that is a tribute to all of the great men and women that work for the police and the fire collectively. Um, I, I can't say enough good about our, our police department. I'm going to throw this question over you, Nick. Nick uh, de Dadalt, about the public safety overall in Southbridge. I'll go back to what Jasmine said earlier uh, during the forum, that I, I think our police department serves as a model for community policing. Uh, they deal with a great deal of issues that uh, are akin to many communities with socioeconomic challenges. And they handle those issues uh, gracefully and with a great deal of care. I've seen them firsthand uh, when I'm out uh, performing uh, my relatively limited role as a call firefighter EMT. But I've seen our police officers in many situations uh, operate under the utmost professionalism in challenging circumstances. And I think this council, along with the town manager, need to stay committed uh, to our public safety department heads and their department's needs. Uh, if the community is not safe as it is now and doesn't continue to improve in that direction, uh, then we're not going to be able to achieve our goals of, of continuing to build this community. And how about you, Mike McKetty? Uh, thank you. Well, it is difficult to find uh, updated crime rate data in Southbridge. Uh, the last time I looked, property crime was up in Southbridge. Uh, assaults were kind of uh, leveled off. So I think it would be a good idea for the council to sit down with the police chief who could give us a better understanding of the crime rate data in town and review his recommendations on policing methods. I'd also like to see a greater police presence in the downtown area, uh, walking the central core. I've noticed that half the lights on Main Street are turned off at night, so I'd like both sides lit up for safety purposes. And there also is some discussion on police wearing body cameras. I know we did receive a grant for body cameras, and I fully support that. Uh, I feel body cameras are needed not only for the safety of the residents, but also for the police protection as well. Thank you. This is a question that uh, I did a, couple, a few of these debates before with the uh, town council candidates. And I would have somebody come up to me afterwards and say, why didn't you ask me this, or why didn't you ask me that? Uh, this would have been a good question to ask. So I'm going to throw this out to the group, and the uh, first one to raise their hand can answer it. And just take about a minute for this one. Uh, this is the question. Here's your question. Excuse me, Rich. I, and George, you know I didn't have you talk about public safety, right. and I appreciate that. Okay. And he would have come up to me afterwards and, and sent me packing down to Florida or no, something. No, I would like have that. Uh, I would have answered that question before you left. Okay, <laughs> appreciate it. I think uh, th this this community supports public safety 100. Uh, percent Council has always seen the needs. They've taken the wants, the needs, and the affordability into consideration when they provide for public safety. No disrespect for DPW, but in life in limb, it's police and fire. And just recently, councils supported four additional firemen and an additional police officer, and hopefully soon to be a second police officer. Uh, the police in this community are community driven. They, they're out there doing community service. That's a, more than you see in a lot of the communities surrounding us. But as far as public safety, I think this town serves its people, and uh, I think the people, in turn, serve the uh, public safety. And we got, we got both departments are great, and DPW is too. George, I appreciate. I'm glad I got you to answer that question, or you got me to ask you to answer that question. Uh, but thank you. Uh, but there still is that one question sometimes nagging in counselors' minds after they do a forum like this. I wish he had asked me that. I wish he had asked me this. Uh, here's the question. 
and it was open to the floor right now. You can just raise your hand. Is there any question that you wished I had asked you tonight? What is it, and what would your answer be? Mike Marchetti, one minute on these questions. Well, thank you. I, I would like to talk about the budget and our finances and our taxes because I consider myself a fiscal conservative and I don't like paying taxes any more than the next guy. But I recognize that the town provides vital services to the residents and that has to be paid for. Now, I looked over the manager's budget proposal and as far as I'm concerned, the, the town's budget needed to be trimmed. For three sta straight years, I don't think the council cut a nickel out of the budget, not one nickel. And I know that some of the councilors have been accusing me of being councilor no, I guess because I'm not afraid to say no to runaway spending. I'm trying to keep taxes down, so I may be councilor no, but it's better than being councilor tax and spend. Uh, the other issue I have with the budget, as I, I would like to see it more transparent to the residents, uh, the current budget contains thousands of line items covering town expenditures, very difficult to read through, so I would like to see an executive summary produced or some sort of annual report. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Now, that was the first one. Anybody else here can answer his quest or his statement if you want. Or really, I'd rather hear, is there a question that you think I should have asked you tonight that I didn't? And what would that question be? And what would your answer be? Mike Montague. Well, I think that, you know, last year, I believe it was last year, there was a question on the ballot about putting in a new fire station. And I think that the people of this town want to know more about how that's going. And, uh, you know, we're supposed to, as counselors, serve the people and, and listen to what they're saying about things. And we need to make sure, because that came in at a specific price, a high price, and we need to make sure that we continue to keep that price for our fire station level. And that goes right hand in hand with Councilor Marchetti talking about taxes. We need to make sure that taxes are controlled and stable and we're paying for things that we need, not things that we necessarily just want that are nice. So we got to make sure that this, this fire station comes in under budget. And I, I still think, you know, it's the, it's the last question that you ask the voters, the community. And, and if you're asking me uh, with no disrespect, uh, I think it would have been nice to hear what everyone had to say about the, uh, the fire station project and how that's been going. Now, if anybody wants to answer that question, that's fine. Or what question should I have asked you or what question should I have asked that uh, you can come up with and answer your own question if you want? George Tenure. I guess the question that I would like to ask is how can government be more transparent to the people that live in this community? And part of the, for me, part of that transparency is to be able to have committees, departments that have public meetings to better uh, inform the people that live here uh, on its town website, for instance. Uh, there is, I'll use the Board of Health, for instance. When they post their agenda, you, uh, it's very generic. There's no documentation to say what they're voting on or what they're going to do. It's very, very generic, one, two, three. You see that through some of the, uh, some of the uh, other, other committees. Well, what I would like to see is that council make a rule and regulation for the town to make departments, working departments, anything that's public meeting, have an agenda and supporting documents with those agenda and to post the minutes of the meetings on the town website. They do the agenda, but there's a lack of uh, minutes and, and people don't understand uh, an agenda when it's so vague. So my thing is to have a better, uh, flow of information to the people in this community. Thank you, George. I, re I appreciate your question, your response as well. Uh, Nick, uh, Jasmine? Go ahead, Jasmine. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Go um, ahead, Jasmine. One so minute. A question that I wish you'd ask. Um, uh, I think a question around how to engage more people in this process. I mean, this this has been a very unique situation where five people are running. Um, I haven't seen that in, in a long time and really um, going into our community and getting people more excited and more involved in the process of civics and town government. Um, you know, our youth and getting them involved in this process, I think like, going back to a time where we used to have a youth representative on the school committee. I'm not sure why that 
went by the wayside. I think that our students have a very unique perspective and they deserve to be heard um, and creating opportunities for other segments of our community to have a voice in this process um, rather than waiting or having a meeting and saying nobody's showing up. Um, I think the pandemic provided an opportunity through Zoom meetings that we saw people participating more. I'd like to see some of that balancing out and being provided um, in certain, uh, at certain times so that more people can participate. And Nick? I'd like to go back to the comments that were made about transparency. I think in a time and age when uh, we're so heavily dependent upon electronics for our, our databases, for our accounting, I think it's very easy uh, and the technology exists for our budget to be made live, so to speak, online for, for folks to pull it up real time. Not just necessarily to see a, a very detailed and professional budget uh, presentation uh, that's made annually, but to see where a department's spending is at today uh, for the current fiscal year. I think that technology exists, and I think when you go to a, a, a department's page on the town's website, you should be able to pull up their budget and see what's going on within that department and to read detailed reports. If you can look up a state employee or a federal employee salary simply by going into a, a, an internet database, you should be able to do the same for a department's budget. I appreciate all the questions and answers. I actually wrote down some of the questions. Uh, those will be on next uh, year's debate, actually, hopefully. And uh, we'll do it again with different uh, candidates as well. Good luck to all of you candidates, and thank you very much for doing this. It's not a requirement that any of the candidates actually do this. But when Maureen and I called out to the candidates, all five of them said, sure, I'd love to do it. And they know it's late, they know it's hot, uh, and they know there's a little bit of pressure in doing all of this for a job that doesn't pay anything. Three people here are going to be your next counselors. It's up to you at home a couple of weeks from now on June 14th. We're going to give one minute responses, uh, or actually one minute closings, because we want to leave some room for the school committee candidates, which are coming up next. So I'm going to start and just go around and start with you, Mike McKetty. Closing statement of one minute, and we've got the timer going. All right, thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone responsible for putting on this forum, and I've enjoyed the ideas and opinions of the residents here looking to serve the community. As I said, I've served on the DPW subcommittee, working on road improvements in town. I also served on the curbside advisory committee, trying to find uh, an affordable replacement, because I don't want to see residents left to fend for themselves when curbside ends. I was chairman of the Capital Planning Committee. We need good capital planning in, in Southbridge for all of our infrastructure needs. We're getting there. There's still work to be done. i like to see improvements in Economic Development Department, a better re re working relationship with the school committee and the receiver, greater communication on public safety, and Finally, I'd just like to say <clears throat> this tax and spend has got to end. I realize there are things in town that we must have, but I also feel that we should learn to live within our means. So working together, we can make Southridge a better place. Experience matters, and I ask that you please vote for me, Michael J. Marchetti, June 14th at the Community Center, 153 Chestnut Street in Southridge. Thank you. Mike, thank you very much. I kind of threw a curveball to the uh, c council candidates and told them their closings would be one minute when I had actually sent them an email said it would be two minutes. <laughs> Tough. You know, I'm, I'm sorry, I ran out of time a little bit, so I have to do it for one minute. So if you've got something prepared, cut it in half or talk real fast. Jasmine, you have one minute. Great, thank you. Thank you, Rich. Thank you, Maureen, for putting this on. Thank you to the candidates. It was great to hear your ideas as well. Um, you know, we, we have a choice to make, and there are going to be three people that get your vote um, come June 14th. Uh, I've been involved in a lot of different committees, um, the Town Manager Substance Abuse Committee, um, a lot of different areas in the community that I've worked with, a lot of people um, on the Town Council, outside of the Town Council, different town departments that I have collaborated with to create a lot of different programs in our community. Um, but it isn't about one or the other. It's about creating a balance between the needs that we have 
to serve and to help our residents and our community move forward and keeping that balance and bringing businesses in to shoulder that burden and not put the burden on our residents. And so I ask you for your vote on June 14th because I think I'm the person that can bring that balance to the town council. Thank you. Jasmine, thank you. Thank you very much. George uh, Chen, your, your closing statement for a minute. Yes, first, I want, again, I wanna thank the committee for having us tonight. Uh, I, I wanna thank all the candidates that uh, are here tonight and the civil process that we've had amongst us and the good discussion and answers that I, I would think any one of us would bring to council if, if elected. Uh, I want to continue uh, serving my community. This community has been good to me in my years of the, in the fire service and I want to be able to bring my goals and objectives to council. And those goals and objectives is be a more transparent government continue the work of, main, of fixing our roads, uh, continue our efforts with public safety, and most importantly is being able to bring our tax uh, rate under control. And I can only do that if you elect me. So I ask you on June 14th to vote for George Shenya at the uh, community center on Chestnut Street. And again, thank you all very much. Thank you, George. And now we will hear from Nick Didalt. You have a minute. Like the others, I want to thank the Town Election Debate Committee for having us here and my fellow candidates for, for uh, joining me here. I also want to thank those of you that are actually watching this portion of the program because it means you watch the entire program and uh, for that I greatly appreciate you. Um, I look forward to hopefully being able to bring uh, my perspective of, of 20 years in government, particularly in, in, in my unique experiences having been a, a regional public safety department head of a regional dispatch center, uh, a federal disaster responder, as well as uh, a former state employee uh, that coordinated Homeland Security for Worcester County and the four Western Mass uh, counties. Uh, I've got a great deal of experience of looking at things on, on the big picture, and, and I believe in a high quality of service with fiscal transparency. So. I want to bring that experience and fiscal responsibility um, here to Southbridge where I know it already exists, but I, I want to make sure that we can continue to promote that. Thank you. And uh, Mike uh, Montigny. Yeah, thanks so much to everybody involved and especially, like you said, the people watching and the people that are going to go out and vote on June 14th. I mean, you have to look at all of the very pressing issues that we have right now we, with the high water sewer tax rates the roads the trash contract breathing down our necks right now and of course the school system what we need to do is come together as one town one community and we need unity to move forward we're going to need to have a strong council with strong leadership and i know that if elected i can help provide that you need to look when you go to the polls at experience and you need to reach down and remember why you have that same passion that we all do to be a Southbridge resident. So if you lived here your whole life, remember your pioneer pride from your days at Southbridge High School and please cast a vote for Mike Montigny on June 14th at the Southbridge Community Center on 153 Chestnut Street. Thanks. And that'll do it for the town councils, but wait, there's more. The town council candidates will now exit the uh, stage. You can take your uh, name tags, it'll be kind of a, uh, It'll be kind of a reminder, thank you very much, of our time together today. I got to tell you, there were no gotcha questions there, but I think everybody did a terrific job with the questions that were out there, and uh, we'll learn and we'll do even a better job next year, and hopefully that you'll be able to watch the town councilors next year. But don't, certainly don't forget to vote on June 14th. We have some candidates who are running for school committee. There is really no contest with the school committee. We have four candidates for school committee and four seats available. And the school committee candidates that are running are Kathy Lapor Lapriori, excuse me, Kathy Lapriori, Wallace McKenzie, Tim Messier, and Andrew Murch. And now we want to talk to the candidates for the school committee. Uh, all four were invited to come. Three of them are here tonight. Tim Messier was not able to make it. If he is out uh, in South Ridgeland, maybe he's on his way in, uh, but it is time to start. We have to finish up just before 9 o'clock, and that's what our plan is to do. 
We have four candidates, Wallace McKenzie, Kathy Lapriori, and Andrew Murch. And we'll start with you, Wallace. Just a statement, and it would take about three minutes is what we had figured, two or three minutes. Three minutes is a long time to talk. If you go two, no one's going to penalize you. Okay, thank you very much. And I do feel that it's an honor to be here, and I also feel that it's my responsibility to share with the town who I am and why I'm running for town um, school committee. I almost said town council, didn't I? <laughs> the, um, my, my purpose and goal uh, is the town of Southbridge. As many of the councilors have talked about, this is a wonderful town. And I've been here for uh, 13 years and, and I love being here. Uh, I care about the town. I care about the schools because the schools are very, very important to the town as we know now. And I also care about the children here. My son uh, was raised in this town and uh, he went to Southbridge schools and he also went to Bay Path. And uh, I'm very, very proud of uh, this town, and I want to be a part to give back to it. That's basically it. Wallace, thank you very much. Kathy LaPriori, uh, you know the, uh, the school committee doesn't have a whole lot of power right now, but it is good that people are on the school committee just in case we get the receivership and we get the schools back in our hands. You'll be on the school committee. But tell me why you're running in your three-minute opening statement. Okay, I'm running for school committee because I've been filling in for um, the past few months and I would like to be a part of helping to improve with communication and other areas of need. Um, the school committee may not be able to vote right now, but our eyes and ears are open. I was thankful that our schools were open safely during the pandemic instead of just being online. I'm looking forward to the end of receivership, and I appreciate the students and parents who stuck with our schools during that time. And listening to the, there was one of the town council hopefuls who mentioned the student rep uh, that we used to have, and I would like to see that happen again. It was a good thing because you knew things that were going on, good things. It was nice to hear some positive stuff. So that's about it. And that's one of the things that was actually mentioned at the town council forum of this program earlier today was putting the student rep back on the town council. And uh, I guess, Kathy, you agree with that. Mm -hmm. uh, Andrew Merch, you can take up to three minutes just to tell us why you're running and what's it all about with the school committee and you. Thank you, Mr. Rich, and again, thank you and Maureen and uh, for having our town council candidates forum and giving the school committee candidates an opportunity to speak. Um, it's greatly appreciated. I don't think we've had a competitive school committee race for the duration of our receivership. Uh, I was elected in 2019 uh, for my first term. I'm up for re-election this year, and I have the honor and privilege to serve as chairman uh, this year. Uh, through my tenure, I have developed a working relationship with the receiver. I've developed working relationship also with different members of d the town councils over the years that have been sat. And I do look forward to continue building those relationships to the, with the new town councilors that will be elected on June 14th. Uh, my son is still in the district. He is a seventh grader. Um, and my passion has been for education for quite some time. I was the Vice Chairman of WCAC's Head Start and uh, Early Head Start's Policy Council for two years when I first moved into town back in 2011. Um, and I have volunteered in some capacity over the last 11 years, um, giving back to the educational community and the kids in this town. Uh, I always tell my son, you know, I, I always tell him to do his best in school and pay attention because I want him to put me in a good retirement home someday. So I want him to have a good <laughs> job, but that the semblance behind that is our children are our future. And I try to make sure we put the politics aside uh, with our school committee meetings and, and in my interactions with uh, counselors and the receiver. Um, I do second the notion of having receivership uh, come to pass 
and us having the responsibility, but we do need to develop a training program for our school committee, which I do intend on working with the receiver this year uh, to develop. Um, so that way we can learn how to govern our school district here in town in the 21st century, and it's been quite some time since we have had power. Um, there have been good things with the schools. There have been bad things. There's, we are no different than any other district. We're just in a little bit of a rough patch, but we are working our way through it, and we will continue to, and we will push forward as Southbridge has done for two centuries now. So we will continue to move forward, and I look forward to seeing these smiling faces with me uh, as we come to seat in July. And I would encourage anybody that next year's election, go ahead and vote. It might be a little intimidate, be a little intimidating sitting up on the dais. Um, I would encourage you to vote and run next year. Um, involvement in your town is very important, and giving back to your community is important. I'll leave you with this. My grandfather told me at a very young age that when you live somewhere, you should always leave it in a better spot than when you got it. However you want to give back to your community is always the best course of action, and it leads to good things in the future, and this is the way I've chosen to give back. Thank you. Very well said, actually. No notes in front of you, I noticed, too. No, nah, I winged it. Yeah, you, <laughs> you had it right up there. Well, that uh, pretty much concludes our entire evening. Is there any, we've got a couple more minutes left with the school committee. Is there anything else you'd like to add, something that uh, maybe you'd just like to say, uh, anything uh, at all that comes to mind? Wallace? Yes, I would like to say that um, I'm very, very pleased in the work effort uh, of our receiver. I think he's doing a, a very, very good job. And I think that we need to work along with him. We need to learn from him. And I do believe that we have an excellent, excellent uh, school committee in place. And I think that things are, are just going to be getting better. Uh, and I think that eventually we will have our school system back in Southbridge and not in receivership. Words of optimism for sure. Kathy, Andrew, anything else you want to add to that in about a minute? No, I guess that's all for now. Um, I'm in the same boat. You know, I encourage everybody to come out to Chestnut Street, the community center, on June 14th to vote. Uh, if you don't have transportation, there are going to be multiple avenues to be able to uh, get there, talk to your friends, see if you can get a ride. Participation in our democracy is important. Uh, town elections usually don't go above... Uh, unfortunately, don't go above about 11 to 12 percent of registered voters. And I hope that this year is the year of change. And I would encourage everyone that's watching to either come out and vote and tell your neighbors, tell your friends, tell your cousins, tell your parents. Come out and vote and, and participate. Um, you will help shape Southbridge's future. Wallace McKenzie, Kathy LaPriori, and Andrew Murch. Three candidates of the four for the school committee. Tim Messier is the other one. They'll all get elected because there's four positions, four candidates. But we thought it would be important that you hear from them today. I would like to say thank you. Thank you for watching. For all the people at home, you'll be able to watch yourself uh, back ad nauseum over the next two weeks because the Southbridge cable system is going to be running this time and time again. And uh, you'll get to see all the candidates one more time. See what you look like on TV as well. I'm curious too. <laughs> And I appreciate being able to do this. Hopefully we can do this every year because I know there have been some years we haven't had a debate and we've actually had contests and not even a discussion. We need to change that and we will going forward. Maureen, thank you very much for getting me involved again this year. Gus, Gus uh, Steves, thank you very much for being here from the news. And thank you with all the candidates and you three particularly for coming in today, especially so, night, uh, so late at night. And uh, that's just about it. That's all we have to say. Maureen, I don't know if you have any words of wisdom at the end. You pretty much expended them all, I take it. But thank you for doing the timing. That's not an easy thing to do. And you did it well. Again, my name's Rich Merrill. On the 14th, two weeks from tonight, the 14th of June, the polls open up at 7 o'clock in the morning. They go till 8 o'clock at night down at the Chestnut Street location. You know where it is. And if you don't, find, a, find somebody who can take you or somebody who can tell you how to get down there. Thank you very much for watching tonight, and you have a good evening. Bye. <laughs>